Greetings and welcome everyone. Um, I'm Jeremy Wallace, a professor in the government department here at Cornell and the current director of the East Asia program. Uh, the Hoosier lecture, tonight's lecture, is the program's most prestigious annual event. Um, Professor Sherman Cochran, whom I saw uh, walk in, uh, kind of argued persuasively and described Hoosier as perhaps the greatest Cornellian in an excellent lecture that you can watch uh, online to this day. And I might have spent too much time today um, rewatching it uh, myself. Um, there's a gorgeous new dorm uh, named in his honor just a bit north of here that I've biked past uh, on more than one occasion. Um, in these interesting days that we find ourselves in globally, um, perhaps too interesting of days, the rich, the rich texture of his life um, could be used in many different ways as could his thoughts and writings. And rather than kind of give my perspective on the way to think about this, let me just leave that perhaps tantalizing idea in your minds for now and turn over the podium to Professor TJ Henricks to introduce our honored guest. Thank you, Professor Wallace. And I would like to thank the East Asia program, including our director, Jeremy Wallace, and especially the East Asia staff. Now, Amala Lane, Sydney Lin, Tiendran Song, Lulu Yuan, Lily Was, and Micah Melville. It, uh, it, it's, this is the product of uh, great teamwork. Um, our co-sponsors, the History, Government, and Asian Studies Departments helped with disseminating news of the talk. And last, but by no means least, I would like to express appreciation for my colleague and co-organizer, Su Young Sung, who does a good passing game and always catches the ball when my attention drifts. Before introducing our speaker, I would like to share our land acknowledgement. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Cayocono, the Cayuga Nation. The Cayocono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of Gayokono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of the Gayokono people to these lands and waters. The annual Hoosier Distinguished Lecture has been bringing to our community scholars who, like Hoosier, put earlier literatures in conversation with contemporary concerns whose work exposes and transcends the limitations of conventional boundaries. Conventional boundaries between disciplines such as political philosophy and archeology, span conventional boundaries between eras such as modern and pre-modern, conventional boundaries between nations and civilizations. Professor Michael Nyland, Jane K. Sather Professor in the Department of History at the University of California, Berkeley, does all of these things. In 2004, our colleague Robin McNeil wrote that after Michael Lowy at Cambridge University, Michael Nyland is arguably the leading Han historian in the West today. 20 years on, we can say that she has consolidated herself in this position through groundbreaking publications, scholarly collaborations, mentorship of junior scholars, teaching, and public speaking. Indeed, over the course of her career, she has been so prolific that a recitation of her book publications alone would unduly delay this presentation. I will therefore mention just a few of her broader contributions to the field. From her first monograph on the great plan chapter of the documents to her magisterial, the five Confucian classics, Professor Nyland has tirelessly brought attention to the historicity of canon formation, learning, and transmission, to the flexibility of historical actors in adapting classical traditions to contemporary problems, and to the contextual, including political and existential stakes of classical learning. She is attentive not only to reinterpretations over time and to reading practices, 
but to broader practices of learning, to the materiality of texts, and the materiality of objects such as mirrors, to the rhythms and textures of daily life, sociality, and socialization, and to what historians of science call communities of practice, very often communities of governing practice. While engaging often collaboratively in comparative studies, she anchors her work in meticulous and deep reading of historical texts, demonstrating time and again the value of rigorous sinological and disciplinary training, something too readily sacrificed. I'm talking about you administration, sorry, in the name of cost cutting. Finally, through her work, Michael Nyland has given us tools for dismantling civilizational tropes, such as those currently being weaponized as nationalist narratives. Her work contributes to better exposing and thus combating the new iterations, for example, of Confucianism as an ideological formation. Today, she will illuminate for us the evidence from early China on majority rule and consortial policymaking. Thank you. Thank you. I have to thank the Cornell community and especially TJ. Um, and um, um, I want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. So forgive me. <laughs> I'm hesitating. Um, um, it's been a warm welcome. And um, it's been an opportunity to reflect upon the path-breaking work of Hu Shu, whose whole life was dedicated to finding early textual traditions that might prove helpful to a rapidly modernizing and globalizing China. Although this Kentucky kid never heard of him until I was in graduate student, um, in a sense, I'm a student of Hu Shu, insofar as my project since graduate school has been to strip away what I take to be false narratives about Asian values with Chinese characteristics, so as to better ascertain what might prove to be valuable today. Needless to say, many false narratives have been embraced by people of Chinese descent for good reasons and bad, as well as by American know-nothings. Only a few weeks ago, for example, the current Taiwanese Minister of Culture claimed that in the long sweep of Chinese history, only post-1949 Taiwan could be deemed an open society. <laughs> and he talked of 2,000 years of Chinese history. About a year earlier, Xi Jinping's propaganda team released a bizarre white paper hailing, she thought, as the final fulfillment of China's 5,000 years worth of aspirations for, in quotes, whole process democracy. I have no idea what either politician could possibly mean, but I feel I can say this with confidence. There is far more in Chinese history to be proud of, politically speaking, than either man's narrow understanding of history would seem to permit. So, in the spirit of Hu Shu, I ask myself, what resources, if any, existed in early imperial times in the area we now know as China that might prove useful to those of us who want to build a more equitable and more sustainable future for China, for the Chinese diaspora, and for other lands and peoples. A more, um, a, a greater vision if we refuse to whitewash or to blatantly distort the facts. In asking this question, I follow recent scholarly lines of inquiry by such historians as Prasenjit Dwara, who's rescuing history from the nation in 1995 
posited an indigenous tradition of dissent, this is a quote, that enabled a degree of contestation much greater than the more modern, in quotes, disciplinary language of centralizing nationalism. I also follow Ho Shu Dong's Han Jada Er Chang, um, published at the very end of last year, which vividly depicts the Han courts as places where the emperors were highly conscious of their inability to act unilaterally, subject as they were to strong institutional constraints. Such histories are in my mind when I translate the documents classic, soon to be published after seven years of relentless <laughs> toil, and when I mull over the Shunza, the early histories, and other masterworks written in classical Chinese. Okay, it's not letting me do that. Let me try that. Okay, it's not letting me move. Um, okay. Um, I'm not sure what I do. Uh, let me try this. Yes, okay, found it. Um, let me begin my talk today with two facts. In 1987, Anton Holsevey, one of the foremost Dutch sinologists of the day, provocatively titled an essay of his, in quotes, Han China Poland, a proto-welfare state. At the time, his argument rested on a single strip set of strips from Mo Zhu Tsui, um, near Wu Wei Gansu, strips that Holsevey admitted in the essay might well be forgeries. Only in the last decade do we have enough excavated evidence from the North China Plain and from the Yangtze River Valley to begin to flesh out Holsevey's picture and to say definitively that the Mo Tzu Tzu content tallies with that of many scientifically excavated materials. In today's lecture, I'm going to avoid reference to the unprovenance materials as their content cannot be. My second fact dates to 1993 when Bernard Williams, then the foremost Anglo-American philosopher of political realism, registered what to many was an equally shocking observation, that his ancients, i.e. the classical Greeks, were in some senses in appreciably better shape, a quote, than we are today when it comes to ethical decision-making, in large part because the ancients did not elevate moral above pragmatic reasons as Christians and Kantians are wont to do when seeking provisional solutions to perennial human dilemmas. With all the foregoing in mind, let me turn to describe the prevailing traditions urging wide consultation and majority rule voting at the courts of the early empires. I'm gonna go back because it slid a double. I didn't like that. Oh, come on. This is, this is too, I'm sensitive. Um, when we speak of voting today, most of us have in mind Joseph Schumpeter's minimalist account of democracy from the 1940s. He's of course an American, he's writing for us. And his definition is one person, one vote to designate a candidate via competitive elections. However, for the antique world I study, a better definition and one that is also in the dictionary would be the act or process of indicating a choice, opinion, or will on a question by some recognized means or procedure. I'm going to tell you that we have in the years 155 to 156, one well-attested instance of a massive referendum held in Sichuan province, wherein household heads, male and female, 
representing a total of 1.5 million voted in a referendum to determine local tax policy. But in my period, the Han Dynasty, um, most often the idea of voting um, surfaces in connection with the majority rule processes undertaken at court conferences to decide the court's future policies. Notably, the final decisions taken by the group specially convened for such a court conference were deemed to have the force of law, i.e. to be like a statute. Until such time as a later court conference, decades and sometimes even centuries later, voted to overturn the ruling or set of rulings. In addition, the early sources inform us that similar conferences were held at the provincial and county levels on both regular and ad hoc bases, even if our court-centered histories provide few details. Still, the newly excavated county level sources that I've been working with with my graduate students frequently talk of so-called advisory bureaus operating outside the capital, even if the fragmentary evidence from far distant locations is hard to patch together. The bottom line is this, even if deciding not to act, Wu Wei in Chinese was the default in governing in the early empires, for many reasons, consequential majority rule voting at court was exceedingly common. By consequential, I mean that such votes with rare exceptions determined the court's policies and they did not merely ratify the emperor's or a regent's will. As I will argue today, two types of highly choreographed interactions, one centered at the court and one centered in the ancestral temple were undergirded, if you will, by parallel implicit social contracts. And it is those contracts that most historians, political scientists, and comparative philosophers have generally failed to consider. And failed they generally have, although there are scattered everywhere, even in modern Chinese remarks, that they realize that the Han Dynasty ran rather differently than the later conquest dynasties. Um, Lu Xun, writing in his essay on chastity, suddenly says, rest assured, I'm not talking about the Han Dynasty, <laughs> to my great surprise. Okay, still, the common wisdom today, East and West, presumes that one man autocratic rule by an absolute monarch enforcing strict hierarchies prevailed throughout imperial China, even if the notion of absolute monarchy is ludicrous given the highly disparate sources of authority that prevailed in early China. And all the more so in an antique world that lack the transportation communication and surveillance capacities that we moderns by fitful turns enjoy and deplore. Explaining why this fantasy is patently false are a good many learned tomes on antiquity. I've just put a scattering of them on this slide. Um, beginning with Patricia Crone, moving on to Carl Pariani, Moses Finley, Michael Mann. But anyway, a review of all of those writings would take too long in a single lecture. But let's just try for the next 40 minutes or so to think away modernity. And if people have particular uh, questions about the conditions of the antique world, I'm happy to address those in Q&A. We have time today to delve more deeply into what our sources tell us about majority rule voting at court during the first 
13 centuries or so of imperial history. Needless to say, I work with a specialist in Tang and Song to make that statement. These sources tell a consistent, if at points, sketchy story. First, as I have noted, our sources for the early empires nearly always identify Wu Wei not intervening as the default rule in governing. Wu Wei advises doing as little as possible, taking as few as possible unnecessary initiatives. Since changes in policies, especially outs those outside the capital, invariably required huge expenditures, not to mention the diversion of enormous labor units to new tasks. Therefore, the court wouldn't, to take an example, consider erecting a dike where no flooding had visited the area in question. But if the wells run dry or a, re a river repeatedly overflows its bank, some timely provision for future disasters becomes prudent and necessary. Those in power, those with access to those in power, and those with technical know-how then convene to consider how best to begin bridge or dike building, storing up extra grain reserves unless there's, in case there's a flood and so on. This all seems obvious enough until we examine our own recent US history, where few states in the union have invested in major infrastructure repairs and alterations for more than 50 years with predictably ruinous consequences. What is key here is this, by the early theorists, the most fundamental capacity for human beings was not to bravely go it alone, but rather in quotes to mobilize for collective action to achieve common ends. That is called to Chun in Shunzi's writings with Shunzi the Chinese equivalent to Aristotle not to act on behalf of community goals, seeing that individual fulfillment rests on a flourishing community, was to live a life of deprivation as an isolated subhuman. Second, our sources in classical Chinese assume that no single person or group of people, no matter how well-educated or rich, has the requisite practical wisdom, technical skills, or information to undertake long-term planning for a co complex society composed of human beings in different professions who hold a plurality of opinions and interests. They further presume that it is seldom easy to ascertain when the exigencies of the present situation demand deviations from past practices that would usually be considered tried and true. That is the primary reason why court conferences must be convened regularly to discuss many affairs of state. Thinkers express this in terms of the need to balance fidelity to constant principles, Jing, by a readiness to make adjustments in light of the shifting contingencies. Trend. The same thinkers further caution that short-term fixes seldom represent good long-term solutions, and there are often unintended consequences, no matter how well you think you've planned. Time and place matter, as do the attitudes of the locals towards the proposed changes, and the Chinese thinkers were acutely aware of such complicating factors. Deliberations by multiple parties, the ruler upon occasion, but always high and low officials plus outside experts are called for in consequence. And no one expects or even seems to demand quick results. Third, I think it's extremely important that the vocabulary used in classical Chinese sources to identify the main actors in governing is remarkably vague and probably intentionally so. Vague, 
so as not to offend the reigning powers that be, and vague, so as to allow others besides the current power holders to weigh in and accrue power over time. I put on the screen um, some examples. The word routinely translated as ruler, as everyone in Chinese studies knows, in many instances means instead the person who is truly qualified to rule, um, which is often not the executive. Um, qualified due to his temperament, his eagerness to learn from others, and his willingness to defer to the judgments of others while set making decisions. Similarly, the term for king as often as not referred solely to the hypothetical true king serving the common good. Conversely, the fuel and father gatherers, the lowliest men in the realm, i.e. the landless, might contain in their group true gentlemen equipped with far-sighted plans. Meanwhile, sure, a turn that once went no uh, meant nobles permitted to wear a sword soon came to mean experts in a given technical field. In this connection, it is vital for us to see that during the early empires, the sage was never held to be omniscient in stark contrast to the sages in late imperial China who fairly float off the ground. It is equally vital to recall that the classical Chinese grammar typically does not specify number, tense, case, or gender. Nearly all meaning is contextually determined, which allows for considerable latitude in interpretation forcing one to look for larger patterns to establish meanings. This explains why we sometimes do not know when reading, whether we're reading a factual, analogical, or wholly hypothetical account. Still, we know the voting was consequential, and we can discern this for several reasons. For example, the standard histories prepared by the court often provide the final tallies for the votes on a particular question, despite the historian's need um, to compress multiple events into short fascicles, more like a New Yorker essay. Just to show you. So we read 692 printed pages. Um, the maximum fascicle is 200 to 500 strips um, with 23 graphs on it. So you really need to imagine and, and think, how are you going to compress it into this? Um, the same histories often identify the leading proponents of the competing proposals by name. The vote tallies were never unanimous or nearly unanimous. The history specifically described the court conference participants being swayed by better evidence or greater eloquence. The decisions arrived at by the court conferences became dynastic precedents. And as court precedents, the final rulings could be modified or reversed only by a new court conference whose pronouncements then became binding for the foreseeable future. Importantly, um, the highly choreographed and lengthy process of aggregating the policy preferences advocated by rival groups and then circulating the competing views via hand copied position papers in a multi-stage process was never designed to produce perfect consensus, but rather to arrive at the temporary best revolution, a resolution of a given policy dilemma. As the Chinese texts call it, a resolution of doubts for the moment. Still, if people felt their preferences and feelings were duly re registered and could be revisited if the need arose, that feeling often went a very long way in getting them to accept 
unpalatable decisions and to deem the current mode of governance roughly equitable, if still less than perfect. Nor were the educational functions of these core conferences discounted. Young administrators were explicitly invited to debate the senior ministers and heavily rewarded for besting them in debate. And all administrators, young and old, were to learn from the accounts presented by the technical experts, the experts in ritual, for example, or the architects and the engineers. Thus, the moral and practical benefits of convening court conferences could hardly be overestimated, according to the smartest early political thinkers. And this dialogic thrust was not merely cheap rhetoric, but something of a real preoccupation with policy majors, judging from both the excavated and received sources. Why was that? To recap some of the chief benefits of having such proceedings, um, here they are. The parties with the most power at court, for example, the emperor, the empress, the regents, the chancellors, were visibly seen to avoid monopolizing the decision-making powers. That, that is repeated over and over and over again. Second, my sources say that having greater numbers mull over a specific problem often leads to better decision-making through wide consultation with disparate groups. Third, long and careful deliberations, if they could not persuade the disgruntled parties, might at least go some way in placating them, since the final ruling in no way represented a rash unilateral dictate. Fourth, in the process of devising their innovative plans, the participants in debate would be devising the very sorts of persuasive arguments likely to convince those outside uh, the court um, of the necessity to support the planned collective actions required by the proposal. And fifth, not only the emperor, but also the members of his court might acquire what I would call plausible deniability if the agreed upon plans failed to achieve success since the decision was manifestly collective and no one party could be singled out as especially to blame. Now I've given you the overview that is consistent in all my sources. Let me give you a rough idea of the specifics a host of topics were routinely referred to court debate, including foreign policy, economic and water control measures, treason or official misconduct cases, revisions to the standard provisions for punishments, the objects, schedules, and locations of imperial cult offerings, the determination of auspicious omens, the allocation of relief after natural disasters, burial rites and posthumous titles for the nobles, kings, and emperors and empresses. You get the idea. They are convening continually. Court debates on a single topic could occupy the court's attention for no fewer than 15 rounds of debate, as happened in 117 BC, with each round generating new position papers in manuscripts that were duly circulated among all the participants, something like position papers. Recall that such hand copying by palace scribes was both hideously expensive and time consuming in manuscript culture. The Stone Canal Pavilion Conference of 51 BC, those were talks devoted to ritual precedents occupied nearly two full years of the court's time, to cite a second example. Most court conferences apparently convened some 50 to 100 participants, but one famous conference boasted no fewer than 902 participants. Conference participants often had to travel over long distances to get to the capital, 
and then be housed and fed in style at the Capitol throughout the proceedings. All this indicates the very high priority that successive courts of the early empires placed on shared rulings on key policy issues, even when the findings of the court were not to the emperor's liking. Um, we know, for example, that the most powerful Eastern Han emperor, Zhangdi, was highly displeased by the rulings produced by the White Tiger Pavilion Conference in AD 79, insofar as the conference rulings represented or advocated a reduction of the imperial status vis-a-vis -vis the officials to a position where the emperor would figure as no more than primus inter pares. As they provided impeccable support for their position um, from past precedents, including the classics and paraclassics, the emperor Zhangdi duly approved the results. Moreover, he revealed to members of his court that he felt incapable of overturning the collective decisions by the participants at the conference, even though at one point he had figured out he might be able to do an end run around them by hiring a ritual expert to drop counter proposals. He decided never to do that. This is not an isolated case. Other emperors, empresses, regents, and ministers had had their pet proposals rejected by their conferences at their own courts. Given all the evidence, we must conclude that this dialogic thrust was not empty rhetoric. So what? Well, um, let me show you just for a moment um, what is going on. Um, this is a classical um, paraclassic, we would call it. It's the Ijo Shu. Um, and what we see in this diagram is that nine people wear the imperial crown. <laughs> Eight, actually, wear the imperial crown. Um, the emperor, for some reason, doesn't wear it. I think so he can see what they're saying. Um, but this is not what we expect to see in the sources. But once we've seen it, it's everywhere. <laughs> okay. Um, so what? Who cares? Um, and um, uh, as one modern put it, and for some reason, I think one slide is out of order. Um, all viable states need a council or a cabinet, a court of inquiry or commission to review rival claims, policies, and procedures. They need an executive and a court of law to oversee policy implementation or lack thereof. Um, Aristotle talked about this tripart division um, in his politics. Or as Sheldon Wolin, a smart political scientist put it, the, simple, the central problematic of governing a polity has always been how to render politics compatible with the requirements of order. What surprises then is that it directly contradicts the standard narrative at each and every point to reiterate. The imperial courts in China regularly assembled leaders and consultants representing competing interest groups who participated in protracted court conferences whose chief purpose was to decide. The results of that voting were consequential, legally binding. Many people besides the reigning monarch could ask that a court conference be convened we know of several regents and empresses, high-ranking officials, a group of advisory consultants at the palace, and even delegations from the provinces who could demand that a court conference be convened. By the five classics, the emperor's vote on a given issue was never to count more than the votes registered by his officials, high and low, by his subjects, 
or by the unseen powers. And a range of institutions, and this is um, a range of institutions, including administrative offices with overlapping duties and a host of mechanisms were expressly designed to keep channels of communication open between administrators and those whom they governed. Um, earlier at a Beijing forum event, I spoke about a specific location, the Northern Watchtower in Western Han Chang'an, where many of these communications occurred. Well, what kind of communications? Petitions by commoners, non-officials, regular reviews of court cases by the administrator higher ups, successive courts dispatch of special envoys out to the provinces to inquire about local conditions. All of these things were devised um, to keep these channels of communication open. And many of the institutions at court as well as the court conferences were established in the belief that administrative checks and balances um, are fundamental to good governance. That's why junior people are invited to criticize the senior ministers and if they do so successfully are catapulted up to the ranks of the ministers. Finally, and importantly, we should note in this connection that the standard accounts of the early empires clearly label abuses of the court systems. Um, if I've lost it, yes. Um, as when the regent Huo Guang abused the system to strip two opponents of their ministerial posts. Now, this is something that might not work in the modern world. But in the early empires, a bad reputation for monopolizing power in a family, even a ruling family, usually entailed serious consequences down through history for one's family members and allies. This was an era when the mirror of history was judged to be a nearly infallible guide to the probable outcomes of specific human activity. After Huo Guang died, the manipulator, we are told, the members of his immediate family were duly executed along with many of their clients. Despite the many services Huo had earlier rendered the Han ruling house during his long tenure as minister and regent. And I'll bring up another example. Um, so many people today point to Han Wu Di and how great he was. In the histories, he is said to be like Wang Mang, the usurper, in that he cannot practice Wu Wei, the art of doing nothing. The foregoing revisionist picture pulls together many undeniable features of antique life. Aside from the imperial line itself, inheritance in early and middle period China meant partable inheritance, so that the family property was divided among all sons and with elites among all children because women got a part of the property as their dowries. Um, this single fact combined with high mortality rates in the pre-antibiotic age, we've forgotten that before 1930s, massive numbers of people died of childhood diseases or women of childbirth. All this made for very rapid upward and downward nobility in short cycles that typically spanned three generations or so. Accordingly, many of the relatively poor and low ranking had had some access to some kinds of knowledge that might prove valuable to the court. That may explain why the court was willing to heed the advice tendered by parties of low rank, why they took petitions from commoners on, on a great number of matters. It's surely relevant too that the founder of the Han ruling house was himself a commoner who rapidly ascended to supreme power thanks to KG advisors. 
It was he who forged an implicit social contract between ruler and ruled, capital and provinces, that was routinely invoked whenever major policy changes were contemplated. Though the social contract's key provisions had been discussed for at least a century or so before the founding of the Han. By the reigning metaphor, the good ruler um, was um, to act on behalf of um, um, the people. He was like a boat and they were the waters um, that bore him. Also, the empire was in quotes, held in trust by the entire imperial family, rather than it being the possession of one person or one dynastic line. Those lines were clearly laid out. True, the imperial subjects owed taxes, labor service, and due deference to the court's authorities. But the court owed them at least as much or more in return for their continuing allegiance. Like the beneficent sun, the court was to shed light on all below. And thus the imperial court paid for a stunning 130,000 administrators, um, and they typically would have 10 people on their staff, so we're moving above um, 1 million administrators for a tax paying population of roughly 60 million. Now, that may not seem like a very great ratio, one to 60 or one to 50, but recall that the Roman Empire under Augustus had not a single paid administrator for a population of 60 million as well. With a ratio of roughly one official or functionary to 50 tax paying people, the early empires in China could be ambitious and they were. They set themselves the task of improving the people's lives and livelihoods. Famine relief, the construction and maintenance of major infrastructure projects, subsidies for the underprivileged and disadvantaged the so-called five afflicted or eight afflicted groups, the provision of local schools and ritual centers. All this took a great deal of planning as well as heaps of money. And I want to argue, and heaps of money is what they had. Mm -hmm. um, at, I'll get back to this slide. At the same time, members of the governing elite were to inculcate minimum standards for correct marriage and mourning rituals. Failure to provide this sort of monetary ritual and education intergenerational assistance gave the locals a reason to rebel and they knew it. And local rebellions were often uh, very difficult to suppress. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about this slide. Um, this is the um, burial of a deposed Han emperor, okay, who was buried um, in 59 BC. And even then, we see 10 tons of metal buried in a quasi-imperial tomb, far from the capital. <laughs> It's full of gold. Um, we're seeing Wushu coins, but um, it was full of gold and bronze ingots um, as well. Um, and clearly they have this kind of money. And why do they have it? They have it because they're the only place at that time that can make silk and that can make lacquer. Those two commodities brought them all this money. But what I'd like to argue is that perhaps the very lack of economic and ideological unity in the antique world, and hence they never aimed for consensus, made the need for wide consultation more obvious. Certainly multiple factors had to be taken into account when the court identified the true sage's desire for wide consultation 
preceding collective endeavors undertaken on behalf of the common good and the lowliest members of society. As we sometimes heard in the 1950s, it's how we took care, how the Han court took care of these lowliest members that was considered the surest sign of legitimate governing. Let me cite a passage from, 100, from 1156 that mirrors a host of passages from the fourth century BC onward. In quotes, not even the rule of such sage kings as Yao and Shun can benefit everyone equally. Thus the key to good governance lies in taking the majority rule as the right view to avoid endless squabbles. Needless to say, none of what I described would have been possible if the early empires in China had not implemented from unification in 221 BC onward, an incredibly sophisticated household registration system in each county. That registry system listed the members of each household their ages, whether they were liable to taxation or labor service, or instead to be granted special stipends to compensate them for any disadvantaged conditions. Nor would it have been possible without the early empire's monopolies on silk and lacquer, which annually brought in such enormous sums to the court's coffers. Um, and that allowed for very low rates of taxation and ample supplements for the disadvantaged as well as for victims of natural disasters. Having explained the underlying social contract binding ruler to rule in early China, a social contract that was far more elaborate than any I know of if any other anti-culture, it seems right and proper to begin to describe the implicit social contract binding ordinary living people, including the emperor, to the unseen powers, AKA the divine. In the area we now know as China, only the emperor contacted heaven, asking that it bless the commoners he shepherded and served. No one divined the will of the highest gods like Apollo or Zeus. Instead, one divined the will of one's own deceased ancestors. And that has been true since 1300 BC, the time of the first writing that has been preserved for us, the Shang Oracle Vaults. If a problem required assistance from gods ranked above one's own ancestors, it was the job of the ancestors as lower level functionaries to forward one's petitions to the high gods. Heaven was conceived of as an afterlife administration as many excavated texts attest. The ancestors plainly had an interest in promoting the continuity of the family because they depended upon the family to supply them with wine or meat, or more precisely, the savers from the offerings that they needed to sustain themselves in the afterlife. At the same time, the ancestors were apt to be displeased by immoral or short-sighted behavior on the part of their descendants, and they could punish their descendants harshly visiting them with illness and sometimes even with death, if the descendants showed themselves to be oblivious to the long-term well-being um, of the family um, by their short-sighted and imprudent activities. Consulting the ancestors through two types of divination, one by turtle, another by milfoil stalks, brought the descendants this benefit. Since the ancestors resided in heaven and as a group had the benefit of collective old age, they were probably more capable of providing to the living a good overview of the situation unfolding on earth below. 
to contact the ancestors, one underwent a fast, after, when, after which one approached the divine for a yes or no answer to a specific question. Shall we go to war with our neighbors? Will the new daughter-in-law be safely delivered of a child within the year? There was none of the obfuscation, deliberate and otherwise, that we find with the oracles of ancient Greece or Persia. And again, since one expected disparate opinions on a given topic, majority rule was to prevail. Here are the words of the great plan chapter of the document's classic I've been translating for the last several years. Seeing to doubts, judiciously establish in office the diviners of Turtle and Milfoil, and then order them to divine by Turtle and Milfoil. Turtles show all these forms and the text describes all those forms. Um, and there are signs for correct alignment and for failure of the divination to go through. Altogether, there's seven signs, five for the turtle, two for the milfoil. If one would deduce the appropriate changes, one sets up leading experts for each of them and has them divine by turtle and milfoil. If three men divine an issue, one follows what two of the diviners say. And by the way, we have explicit documents that say the very best diviners at court are expected to have a 70% rate of divining the ancestors as medical doctors are expected to have a 70% rate. So again, not perfection. Then in cases of grave doubt, the divination results um, uh, from turtle and milfoil. And one weights the vote of the turtle slightly more heavily in a few extreme circumstances. But all of those results are to be correlated with the results reported of the ruler's own heart, the members of his administration, and the commoners themselves. By a complicated procedure outlined in the Great Plan chapter that distinguishes foreign policy from domestic policy, these groups all together have five votes. Generally speaking, majority rule wins here too. So even if the world of the living reaches a consensus that is opposed by turtle and milfoil, each registering the ancestor's will by a different divination method, it's auspicious to do nothing and inauspicious to act. And if the ruler and the turtle agree, domestic decision-making may proceed, but all outside matters, i.e. diplomacy and war, are never to be contemplated. Significantly, if the ruler and his ministers and officers dispute the wisdom of a given course of action, but the turtle, milfoil, and commoners coalesce around a decision, the court may proceed. There are other procedural rules about ascertaining the will or wills of the dead, but what is perfectly clear in every description of this process as outlined in the classics, the nominal head of the empire, the ruler, is never to decide policies unilaterally. The ruler, we learn, thereby educates others about the wisdom of learning to yield and lead by turns. Um, and there are no exceptions um, of this, except in the case of a few recalcitrant evildoers. My conclusion is this. In modern discussions, what matters most with voting is the autonomy and rational choice of the person voting. That is missing naturally from the early empire sources because those are quite modern concepts, absent in all of the slices of antiquity with which we are familiar. 
I've been spending a lot of time lately thinking about the modern philosopher Tsujiwe's notion, which echoes Foucault in a way, that every successful state subjects its members to various kinds of subjugation uh, by a kind of magic trick. Um, the secret, secret of today's liberal society, as it were, is its ability to style a liberal society as seemingly the least coercively governed large scale society that has ever been invented. So what I'd like to say is that I wonder whether we look, when we look at antiquity in the world we now know as China, if we are not looking at something similar um, in the way we think of what is the magic trick. Um, people before me have suggested, David Strand working in the modern period, um, that somehow public aspirations were unfinished. And he thought that was because there were no strong institutions in China. That's certainly not true of my period. Then we have Kenneth Pomeranz, and he's saying there was only a great divergence in the 18th century um, with fossil fuel, uh, mechanical, um, and also the colonization of um, other uh, places, which brought massive amounts of cash into Europe and America and allowed the bourgeoisie to flourish. My own hypothesis is this. What we see in the early empires seems to be a third alternative, wherein attempts to generate questions and devise solutions only make sense if most members of the community subscribe to the twin notions of human imperfection and intergenerational equity, which in turn rests on two beliefs that most of us wish to be part of some larger good and that to do this requires that we take a longer view. I come to this doubtless because of my own interest in feminist care ethics and environmental issues, but I am a good historian and I didn't believe this story mm -hmm. until I found it also in the excavated sources. So. Thank <laughs> you.